Everybody, how you doing? Corey Coleman here. And again, everybody comments on how I'm here in the middle of the day and I always say I'm in here, I'm here in the middle of the day. And if I say that I'm here in the middle of the day, that means I have someone very special with this. And I am tremendously excited today to be talking to a master puppeteer, master muppeteer, performer, director, Mr. Matt Vogel. Matt, how are you? Hey there, Corey. I'm great. How you doing? I'm doing great. And Matt just told me that across the street from him, they're doing something that's kind of loud over there. He said, so you might hear this buzzing every now and then. And it, it just happens sometimes. But I you doubt know. once the conversation starts that anybody will even notice. Uh, Matt, we're about to throw things to you in a little bit. But just to give people some context right here, not that Matt needs that much. Uh, as I said, you heard me uh, say the word Muppeteer, which means that this man, he voices some of the most beloved Muppets out there that you would recognize across many generations uh, who can be seen or, and heard right now doing the voice of Kermit the Frog on Disney Plus's show Muppets Now. We're shooting something here to help spread the word about how the Muppets are creating an incredible new show for Disney Plus. My, uh, wow, you know, this must be, uh, and I'm sure everybody says this, but with uh, you just doing the voices spot on for several of these characters, this uh, this must have been a, a huge dream come true for you. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was a dream that I didn't even know that I had, actually, Corey. You know, I, I mean, I, I was always fascinated with with Muppets growing up, and I was a huge Muppet fan and Sesame Street fan, but I never dreamed in a million years that I would be, number one, uh, a Muppet performer on Sesame Street uh, and with the Muppets, and number two, playing these uh, amazing, iconic characters that I am so uh, blessed to be able to play. You know, uh, in addition to Kermit, as I said, you do so many other voices. Uh, you know, you, you have some, uh, some new characters that we see on Muppet now and other places, but then you know you, you have Muppets that have been around since I was a kid, and believe me, it's been it's been a while since I've been I've been a kid. Uh, you know, I'm looking at some of the characters, such as of course there's Big Bird, then there's the Count uh, Floyd. Now I'm just naming just a few. Uh, even Mr. Johnson, as I know him as as Blue Guy. We're going to talk about him in a little bit. But, uh, you know, with you doing so many voices and, again, doing them spot on, did you just study Sesame Street and the Muppet Show and Muppets coming up? Or can you just do impersonations in general? Well, I don't really see what I'm doing as an impersonation or, or uh, mimicking a voice as much as trying to embody the character. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and a, a lot of these characters I've inherited from uh, master Muppet performers that came before me, including uh, not only Jim Henson, but Carol Spinney and uh, Jerry Nelson. And those guys were truly masters of their craft. And I was fortunate in the case of Carol and Jerry to be able to work alongside them and learn from them and uh, and 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 kind of carry forth the vision of those characters, how they saw it. So it's not really an imitation for me, uh, but I am trying to, you know, get in the in the ballpark of the voice. But to me, it's more about the heart of the character and, uh, you know, who that character really is inside. Well, you know, that's that's an interesting thing to say, because I think that's what a lot of people don't understand about puppeteering in general, is that there's, you know, it's not just a voice. There's a there's Carol Spinney and even have something because you, as we said, you do Big Bird. And while we're talking about that, I'd like to show some uh, footage of you uh, at, uh, in Carol Spinney uh, when you are, I guess at the time when you were auditioning for Big Bird. And there's a very young uh, Matt mm -hmm. Vogel right there. And, uh, and that's Carol Spinney behind you. You know, Carol Spinney said that's something right. again uh, to the essence of what you're saying is that, you know, there's more to just... Uh, you know, a puppet's voice and just making it move, there is a soul behind it. It was sort of intimidating to think that someone else is playing Big Bird. I know I, I don't own him, but I, I own his soul. Hi, everybody. Hi. Um, you know, it, it's funny that that you had Carol Spinney say that, that, uh, you know, he's done this character for so long and he's yeah. put the soul into this character. What kind of attachment do you have to the characters when... Uh, 
when you're doing them, do you see yourself developing that same kind of, you know, almost, and, and Carol Spinney said, no, you don't want to have ownership over the character, but you can't help but feel that over years. Do you feel that? Oh, sure. Of course. You know, I, I've, uh, I was Carol's right-hand man. I was his understudy for 20 some years and uh, watched how he uh, put forth this character, which came very much from who Carol was mm -hmm. and uh and uh yeah i mean i think that happens with any of us who are muppet performers is that inevitably if you're doing it right a part of you uh a part of who you are comes into those characters in fact uh jerry nelson who i mentioned before he played the count and floyd mm -hmm. pepper and a ton of other characters that i get to play he said once that what these characters are are really just little parts of who we are and then we just blow them up to make them bigger than life. In with you going in and, and having to, you know, pretty much, uh, I guess, be in, in an apprenticeship and, and a mentorship. You know, you, uh, I believe you 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 auditioned in 1993 for Henson Studios, and it was a little later than that, but yeah, but uh, yeah. Okay, yes. okay, so it was like 95, 96. Okay, because for what you know, what I was uh, what I was understanding is that you, I guess you went in and you auditioned about in '93, but then you actually joined the company. You know, I, I don't know if it was hired or joined, or you were just you know, I, I, they let you in or in in '95 yeah. or '96. Was there was like was there a period where you went in and you, you auditioned and then they said, well, that's 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 great, kid, but uh, you know, we're not looking for anything right now, and you had to come back. No, you know, I was actually really fortunate from the very first time I walked through the door of the Jim Henson company. Uh, John Henson, who was Jim's youngest son, had put out an, an audition alert for people to come in and audition for him. And that was the very first thing that I did. I wasn't, I didn't have, didn't even live in, in New York City yet. Uh, I was still living at home in the Midwest and uh, in Kansas City. And I saw this ad, in, actually my girlfriend, now wife, saw this ad in the paper <laughs> and it had a picture of Kermit the Frog and it said, do you measure up to be a Muppet? And they were looking for somebody my height and left-handed, but like I am. And, uh, and so I answered the ad being a huge Muppet fan. And uh, lo and behold, I finally moved to New York. And in fact, John said, look, let me know when you get to New York. So I did. And I don't know if he had auditions before I was there or not, but when I got to New York, I told him I was there. I went in and did this audition, and that day, I was the last guy to audition for this uh, Coca-Cola polar bear that they had. The yeah. Jim Henson Company had built this massive uh, replica of the CG Coca-Cola polar bear, and this it was something that John was doing. He would go around to Coca-Cola events and uh, supermarket events, and he would be there live and in person to greet people and meet them and, and show up, and he was looking for somebody to kind of double for him when he was unavailable. He was very busy. So that day I was the last guy to audition and he said, uh, you want to go to lunch with me? And I said, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, <laughs> sure. Of course I want to go to lunch with you, John Henson. <laughs> and we went to lunch and, and, you know, we talked and at the end of that talk at the end of that lunch, he said, do you want to come up to my house for New Year's Eve? And I was like, I, yes, wow. I do. I do want to come up to your house for New Year's Eve. So we did, and, you know, soon after that, I started doubling for him as this Coca-Cola polar bear. So I didn't have that time where, you know, I kind of came in and did a blind audition. This was a very specific audition for something, and John picked me to do that. And from that, I uh, was asked to create a, a puppet reel, like an audition reel, and I submitted that, and then I was involved in some workshops, which is kind of the way that it usually happens. And so I did some workshops, and then eventually, uh, down the road, I I did uh, a thank Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, I think was my first thing. And then after that, I met Carol Spinney. You know, it's interesting. What do you think it was about being the Coca-Cola bear at the time that made him say, wow, you know, come over to my house, man, for New Year's? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it was. I, I, I really don't. You know, I was thinking, I literally was thinking about this the other day. I was like, what was it that he saw in me? I, I really don't know. I, it, we only communicated, I think it was, I may have made a phone call or I, I, I may have written a letter 
you know, typed a letter and I may have <laughs> sent that to the Jim Henson company initially. And then there may have been a phone call, but we never had met before that moment. Uh, I don't know what he knew about me other than, you know, I guess he liked what he saw in that audition. It's really cool to hear about things that we don't think about outside. If, you know, when you're, if you're not a puppeteer, if you're not there on the set, you don't ever think that there's things like a height requirement. <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't think about which hand you have to do this puppet with. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious to know, and I could probably guess, but I'm curious to know where the height requirement comes in and why, does it, why is there a difference between what hand you're using at the moment? Okay, well, for that particular thing, for the Coca-Cola polar bear, it was, he needed somebody that was about six foot, six foot two, which is up six foot two, and he needed somebody left-handed because uh, typical puppeteers, mm, uh, typical puppeteers, they're right-handed. Um, and so the right hand goes up into the head, and that's how you make the, the mouth move and everything, and then uh, he was looking for somebody that would be able to put the left hand up in the head so that the right hand could shake hands with people, mm -hmm. could do other stuff like that. So that was very specific to that audition. That we have uh, Muppet performers on Sesame Street and with the Muppets that are of all different varying heights and sizes. And uh, you know, there are some people that are maybe a little shorter than myself or some of the other guys, and so they have these tall shoes that they wear on set uh, when we're standing up. Uh, but, you know, we're not uh, discriminating against, you know, size or height, generally speaking. Oh, but, I, I didn't mean to you insinuate know. that you, <laughs> you no, know, no. <laughs> if you're a dwarf, you can't work on the set or anything like that. Um, I, you know, I want to uh, get a little serious with something here because this is, uh, this is something I've always wanted to ask anyone who works in children's entertainment, especially over uh, at PBS. So, you do, I believe you do a voice for a character named Alex. And Alex, his father, is in jail. And I believe that this is part of the Sesame Street, uh, Sesame Street uh, Communities Initiative, where they are, this is at least an initiative to talk about incarceration. So, I mean, look, if you've watched Sesame Street, anybody out there over the years, you know that there's been all kinds of issues that has been addressed with Sesame Street, anywhere from AIDS to racism, which is a clip I'm going to show here because... You know, when you have some children's shows, in particular Sesame Street, when they start to address serious things, it seems like there's always a detractor out there that wants to come in and sort of negate that. Uh, this is a clip from Tucker Carlson Tonight, where he's talking about uh, when Elmo's father came in and discussed racism with him during the protest, you know, during the time with the BLM rising up and protesting. People of color, especially in the black community, are being treated unfairly. America is a very bad place and it's your fault. You have no right to complain. Now, I don't want to politicize this, of course, in any kind of way, but it does seem like whenever you have a children's show come in and try to talk about something serious, you have someone who's always there to push back and say, it's a children's show. Why can't you just be about fun? You know, what, well, how do you feel about that? Does it frustrate you? Do you laugh it off? How do you approach this? Well, I think that Sesame Street, Sesame Workshop uh, uh, as a whole, they, their mission is to create children who are smarter, stronger, and kinder. That is their whole mission. And, you know, it starts, of course, with the alphabet and counting and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we also want to teach on our show compassion, uh, uh, kindness, uh, anti-bullying, um, and who better to do this than Sesame Workshop, really? They have a, a, a large, the ability to reach millions of children and get across a message that hopefully will touch them and make them take a, another look at something or uh, think think twice about something or, or, or maybe a kid might see themselves in this situation. And that's why I think Sesame Workshop is so successful at what they they do. They see a need out in the world, whether it is uh, incarceration, whether it's divorce or military families, which they've done a lot uh, of initiatives on, or food insecurity. And they see that need and they meet it. They meet the challenge of that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm super grateful to be a part of an organization that finds those 
missions that important to try to address and to reach children. You know, so you're talking about how this, you have these initiatives to reach children out there. I know there was a concern at one time about Sesame Street going to HBO Max, which is a paid mm -hmm. platform. They felt like maybe this would sort of keep Sesame Street further out of reach of some of the communities and children that, that need them. Uh, when you heard that this was happening, what was your initial reaction to it? Well, uh, first and foremost, you know, the, the Sesame Workshop reached out to all of us ahead of that announcement to say, you know, here are the, here are the terms of this deal. You know, we, we partnering with HBO will allow our show to live on. And, uh, and that's what has happened, but they, the stipulations of the contract are that it will also go and be available to PBS for free after mm -hmm. uh, a certain time limit. So <clears throat> PBS, in terms of being able to air Sesame Street, they have not lost that ability. And so partnering with HBO, I think, and Sesame Workshop doing that has really helped uh, bolster the show to be able to uh, reach not only children uh, on this platform, uh, the streaming platform, but also kids that are, are uh, PBS watchers. You know, uh, you've directed several episodes of Sesame Street. Uh, got a clip here where this is some of them. These are some of my favorite moments from Sesame Street. I used to when I was yeah. a kid. I used to always love <laughs> when you had Stevie Wonder come on or the yeah. Pointy Sisters. Every time there was a musical guest that came on, it was really, really cool to see them hanging out with kids because you see and hear stories about the rock and roll lifestyle. And then you see them be parents, uh, just being cool with kids and hanging out. You directed this episode with uh, Dave Grohl oh, of yeah. the Foo Fighters, man, where he hung out with hung out with uh, Elmo and Big Bird. <laughs> this is our friend, Mr. Dave Grohl. Hi. Here we go. We're on our way. Man, I was watching this this morning in bed, and my wife and I were just, we were bobbing <laughs> our heads and having a great time, man. Yeah. With this... Uh, I always want to know how you decide to, what's the approach to getting certain uh, uh, artists on, whether they be actors or they be uh, musicians? I don't know really very much about how they do that. I'm sure the producers have a list and they probably go through it and vet people. But uh, the great thing about having Dave Grohl is that we had worked with him, the Muppet performers had worked with him on the uh, the first Muppet movie in 2011. 11 he was part of that and then we did the, uh, a series on abc called the muppets that he came and did that and then finally here on sesame street we got to have him there and, and that was uh it was a blast it was so much fun i'm such a, a huge uh, dave and uh, foo fighters fan so it was really a, a great day for me yeah, man, that looked like a lot of fun. Hey, man, I was, those segments take me back. I, I was in bed just laughing and giggling, man. You know, I, I still I still like to watch Sesame Street every now and then, man. I really do. I yeah. say every now and then. I watch it all the time. Who am I kidding? But, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I, I, I was looking at you know, some of the things that you had done also uh, outside of Sesame Street, but still with the Muppets. Uh, you know, I was look, looking at this commercial that you did right here for uh, Chrysler Pacifica. With I'm gonna tell you, Grover is my favorite Muppet, and I'm gonna ask you, and I'm yeah. gonna tell you why in a little bit. But you know, you have Oscar here and Grover, and this is a car commercial. So, and I'm looking at that, and I'm and talking about directing, and makes me think about Frank Oz. Frank Oops, I lost you there, Corey. Oh, did you? What'd you say? Oh, now you're back. I lost you for a second. Oh, there. okay. I was talking about you directing so many things, and then I was pointing out Frank Oz here, who, oh, yeah. you know, it, I guess for me, you know, when I talk about a puppeteer, a puppeteer that's gone on to doing things outside of uh, what we know them as originally, Frank Oz comes to mind, man. Frank Oz comes to mind because Frank Oz not only went out to direct other things, but he also directed. He directed movies that skewed sometimes more adult, and I always admired that when I learned that about him. I thought that was so cool that he had such a broad range of talent to direct stuff. Do you actually see yourself maybe one day directing? Maybe you already have. I don't know. Do you want to direct something outside of Sesame Street, and maybe do you want to direct for a different demographic one day? Oh, sure. That would be a blast. You know, uh, one of the things about being a director on Sesame Street 
is that, and this, I, I can't speak to Frank's experience, but being a performer, we sit and look at the monitor, which shows us what what the shots are. That's what that's what our job is. We're not just you know holding our hands up and looking up. We're looking at a monitor that shows us what you're watching at home, mm. and so that's what we do all day. We're watching TV and we're kind of learning. Especially if you've got a d good director that you're working with, you're kind of learning always what it is, how how to build a story. You know, wide shots, close ups, when you want to do a special shot, etc. Et so. For Muppet performers, there are a few who have gone on to do directing, directing the show and directing some other things. And, you know, it just kind of felt, felt like a natural fit for me. Uh, sure, I would love to go and direct some some other stuff. Uh, uh, you know, right now I'm, I'm truly very busy with uh, the combination of Sesame Street and the Muppets. But, you know, who knows? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that would be very exciting. Like I said, I love seeing... Uh, performers just expand their range, man. Yeah. So, I, we, you know, we we're going to go back to Big Bird just for a moment here because. All right. I've always wanted to talk about the physical aspect of playing a character like that. I because again, I've seen interviews where Carol Spinney, who originally does Big Bird, talk about how it's just a, it, it is physically taxing to do that character. Two things. Do you have to do you have to physically prepare to work to the to work that character? Do you have to exercise? Is there do you have to be physically in shape to do that? And the other question of this, this is a two part question here. Has there been any kind of improvements on the the puppet itself? You know, with technology advancing, has there been any improvements to make that the 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 the, the, the physical aspect of working it a little bit easier? Okay, so you know, yes, I should probably stretch before I get into the, into the bird. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the other Muppet performers, Martin P. Robinson, he plays uh, Mr. Snuffleupagus, who is a huge two person uh, puppet. Yeah, he definitely limbers up and stretches out. And I do stretch a, a little bit, probably not as much as I should. I have been injured uh, performing Big Bird. Wow. Tweaking my back or pulling something in my arm. Uh, but in general, it's it's. It's not so bad, you know. I've, I've, you know, taken a wrong step and fallen, you know, into <laughs> a hole or something, and uh, so it can be a little dangerous because you really can't see anything. You can't see anything inside. I have a monitor attached to my chest, but that just only shows me what you're seeing at, at home. So I can't, I don't necessarily see the floor or you know the edge of the platform that I'm standing on. So it can be a little bit physically taxing and potentially dangerous but uh <laughs> the puppet over the years you know it's it's changed a little bit but really the basic inner workings of his head are pretty much the same as they have always been uh it's you know they're real feathers that are hanging off of big bird and uh those have some weight to them and uh, many of those feathers are backed with like a tiny uh, another backing on it and then those mm -hmm. are sewn onto the onto the neck and uh so it's just it's it's you know it's i'm not saying it's like 50 pounds uh sometimes it feels like it's 50 pounds but uh it hasn't really been improved that much over the years you know that is something that is in the back of my mind to do because i'm sure there are materials nowadays that are much lighter that we could use uh carbon fiber and things like that that we might be able to utilize uh or some certain plastics or you know 3d printing i don't know what we can do with that but that you know remains to be seen the other side is you need to build something that can last that's durable that will last for years and years and years and sometimes that means you have to kind of use the tried and true uh materials that are available no i that's that's really fascinating to hear that not only have we all known that big bird is possibly you know a very uh, physically taxing character to play but i didn't know it was dangerous <laughs> <You know? laughs> it can be you know carol spinney he he took a. uh, uh he was going to he almost took a step into a, an orchestra pit and his lovely <laughs> wife debbie grabbed big bird grabbed him i think by the tail and just and fell back in order to prevent him from stepping into a you know a very dangerous situation so. yeah 
It can happen. Wife like, like almost saved his life. It's not like you got to have like people around you just ready to catch you at any moment. Yes, we do. We have these, we have amazing, we call them wranglers. They are Muppet wranglers and they, <laughs> not only do they uh, transport and uh, prepare the puppets for us for every day, whether we're on Sesame or with the Muppets, they get the puppets ready for us. They put them in outfits that they're supposed to be on. They'll uh, change a rod, which we move the arms with yeah. if we need it. They'll do all kinds of things. But there's a there are wranglers that put me inside Big Bird and take me out of Big Bird. Wow! And they're always, you know, uh, you know, I when we're on set or particularly when we're in the real world, real world, real world situations, I'm always on the, I'm always listening out for them to go stop. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm walking somewhere. Which has happened. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great, man. That's great to hear. I mean, also, um, I mean, I'm not laughing at your dangerous situation, but that's, that's great to hear. Uh, yeah. Got a couple of more questions here uh, before we're done. Um, one, kind of going back to some of the more serious things that you guys approach or serious subjects that you guys approach with, uh, with uh, certain topics on Sesame Street. So are you part of that process uh, the creative process when they think of what issues that we might need to talk about uh, to with kids? I am not a part of that process. They have uh, task forces and they have uh, uh, groups of people, not only producers, but people within the Sesame Workshop organization, or as I understand it, and other people that might be outside Sesame Workshop who can help uh, bring opinions and insight to potential subjects for a Sesame Workshop to approach. But uh, I'm not a part of that process. I usually come in as uh, either, you know, a director uh, mm -hmm. and have opinions on things and uh, or as a performer. And we are also allowed to have some opinions on things, but always trying to keep in mind what the objective is for this particular uh, social impact project. Um, so, you know, not not at the beginning, but we are we do have the ability to be influential at, at a certain point. This is perhaps my most serious question right here that I'm going to ask. And if you don't want to answer, I understand. But, you know, over the years when I've watched Sesame Street. And I tell you, Grover is one of my favorite characters, and but this has always bothered me. So him and Mr. Johnson, who you also voice yes. Blue Man, who I refer to yeah. lovingly as Blue Guy. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people call him Fat Blue. Fat Blue. It's, it's the shape of his head. Oh, no, that might get you canceled. <laughs> that might get you canceled no, today calling him Fat Blue. I don't think that's correct, politically correct no, right there. Here's, but. here's why. Let me, let me tell you why. See, uh, they have a bunch of these characters that are called anything Muppets, right? Mm. And they are all different shapes. So some of them are called pumpkins because they kind of are shaped uh, pump, they're pumpkin colored. Uh, some of them are called Guy Smiley's because they have the shape of Guy Smiley's head. Mm -hmm. Some of them are called uh, Little Pinks because they're little, little tiny little characters like Prairie Dawn. Uh, there are Fat Blues, which are the ones that are big round headed blue characters. Uh, what else is there? Lavenders and Greens. And they, ha they have a bunch of different uh, names for them. There's like an eggplant. I think we have an eggplant. <laughs> and it's just a way for us to kind of go, oh, that's, that's the look that I want for that scene. And so that's typically what people have called him and then there's fat young. blue <laughs> well this is what's bothered me over the years yeah. the, the, those two characters have they've been at each other for a long time man uh some, one of my most favorite episodes of sesame street when i was a kid where fat blue would walk into a restaurant and grover would walk out and he'd be like ah, this guy again ah. yep. and and they would, and sometimes you watch an, uh, an episode, and it would be Mr. Johnson kind of, you know, not being, you know, he'd be the, he'd kind of be the, uh, the rude one. And then sometimes Grover would be egging him on. And here's a, here, to give you a little, uh, for those of you who don't know about this ongoing feud, here's a, here's a segment of uh, Mr. Johnson being served by Grover, who was never giving him, in his opinion, great service, even good service, a decent service, when he would go to the restaurant. And no matter what restaurant he went to, Grover was always there. All right, I warned you, I warned you. Broil the piggy! I know what I want, I want the big... <laughs> okay, so, you know, Grover pretty much tried to commit murder right there, some people say. <laughs> yeah, you know, that's funny. I was talking with Eric Jacobson, who plays grover 
And uh, we were kind of looking at like, what what is Grover's objective here? And he said <laughs> that literally anytime Grover and Mr. Johnson are in this kind of situation, Grover is legitimately trying to help. Grover's not very smart. And so he, I don't think anything he is doing is with a malicious intent. I think it's all, uh, you know, according to Eric, he says, you know, he's, he's just trying to help. He's just not very good at it. Uh, okay. So just to, to kind of bring some closure to this feud, at least from your point of view, it's Grover's fault. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Ah, I think I just lost a bet, man. I defended Grover all this time. <laughs> um, one more thing here. Sure. Now I'll let you go, sir. Uh, so you put out a tweet mm-hmm. not too long ago, uh, a couple of days ago. It says they're calling all Muppet, at least it's from the Muppets account. Uh, right. Calling, calling all Muppet fans, get ready for a major and important Muppet announcement coming soon. What is it? We have no idea. I think you have an idea, and I don't know if you'll share it or not. I, I have no idea. You know, uh, we're always the last to know. That in itself, I don't know if I should believe or not, but I, <laughs> but I, you know, I figured it would be worth a try. Of course. Yeah. But I, I have no. I don't have any idea. What okay. It is. So I guess we'll. Have, I have to find out, like everybody else out there. Well, yeah. Matt. I really, I know you're very busy. You have so many things to do, directing and so many Muppets to voice. And Oh, here's one thing I, w- I want yeah. to know. You are what they call a Muppet captain. Now, yes. Okay, okay, so what does, what does a Muppet captain do? The, the Muppet captain is the person that sits in uh, production meetings uh, as kind of one of the department heads. I'm kind of the department head for the Muppet performers. And I will... Uh, do casting for, uh, you know, like roles that are like one-time roles, people that just come in, you know, a dog comes in or, a you know, a, a cantaloupe enters and I cast for those. But I also sit in the production meetings and when moments in the script, when we go through page by page, they say, you know, how are we going to fit 12 chickens in a wheelbarrow? And then we'll discuss that, how I'll think how, I would do it. Uh, and then the Muppet Workshop, which is part of the Jim Henson company, they will kind of put in how they think we should do it. And uh, and so that's one aspect of it. And then on the actual shooting day, I am there as the puppet captain to kind of make sure that everything is uh, rolling along smoothly so that there are no issues from the Muppet performer aspect, um, how it goes from uh, performing that show to making it actually happen. And then in the post-production aspect, I am looking at edits to make sure that they all look good, that the puppets are looking right, and that they all look appropriate. And that's it. That's what I do. I like the way you go through this long list of what a Muppet captain does, and you say, mm, and that's it. That's, that's a lot, man. <laughs> that's all. Yeah, one day, you know, it's just a captain, though. You know, one, one day I hope to be the Muppet ab- Admiral. Is there an actual Muppet Admiral? <laughs> You, There's not. You could actually make that role though one day. <laughs> I know I should. I guess I could. I could just say I demand to be called the Muppet Admiral from now on. Yeah, you Muppet Captain. Just promote yourself, man. <laughs> so, I, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, Matt, I really appreciate you coming in and taking the time, man. You know, it was very educational for me. I, at least I got to ask all the questions that I've wanted about for years. So I greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Corey. Thanks for having me. All right, people. There you go. And thank you. Bye bye. And there he goes, folks. Uh, Once again, very honored to talk to someone who has an attachment to my childhood, things that I love to do, uh, things that I love to see. Yeah, you know, look, it's no secret that I am a grown man who loves puppets. And so that was that was a dream conversation for me to have right there. So, everybody, thank you for tuning in. Or clicking on to the interview or watching it, whatever you're doing, however you're getting it. I appreciate it. And before you go, I always have to remind you, you know, I couldn't do these interviews or anything that we do without you out there. That's why my door is always open to you. Because if I'm not streaming, that doesn't mean that you can't get a hold of me at... 
kcoolmans at gmail.com. That's K-C-O-O-L-M-A-N-Z at gmail.com. You email us with any kind of questions, comments, compliments, insults, input, and our advice. Hit us up on our social medias, Instagram, Twitter, and Face to the Book. Copy all the information down right there. Memorize it. Love it. And most importantly, use it. And if you find yourself wanting to come to Austin, Texas, uh, it's probably better times to come than now. But I know you're going to be here one day. So when that better time does roll around, that's when you hit us up here. But until then, let us know your plans. Kcoolmans at gmail.com. And let us know if you plan on moving here to lovely Austin, Texas. Hopefully you'll do so when it's safe. Or you're just passing through because I believe once again, one day, we will safely be able to hang out with you. All right, everybody, that is it. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you supporting. Appreciate you watching or listening or whatever you're doing. I love you. All right, everybody, that is it. Good night, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whenever you listen to watching this, goodbye. And stay toasty.